Welcome to The Individual Animal, a podcast about dogs, people, and sheltering. I'm your host, Nikki Yukum, here with my co-host, Bernice Clifford. How you doing, Bernice? I'm doing great, Nikki. How you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. It's going to be a tough topic today, so... Yes. Not one we want to talk about, right? No, definitely don't want to talk about it, but I think we need to talk about it. I think so, too. Um, yeah. I think, you know, it, in the business that we're in, I, I come from dog training. Um, and so for me, saving animals has always been what I prefer to talk about. Um, but today we're going to talk about behavioral euthanasia. Yep. Yep. And I think it's important to say nobody wants to make these decisions. Nobody takes joy out of making these decisions. Right. Agreed. So is there a place you want to start? Oh, sure. Um, I, guess I, <laughs> I, I guess I can start. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, I guess I can start by telling everyone a little bit about um, where I started and, and where I've gone from there. Um, because I think most folks listening to this know me from sheltering. I've been at Animal Farm now for 19 years. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, but before I came to Animal Farm, I actually worked for six years in a private veterinary behavior practice, um, which is very different than, than sheltering. But during that time, um, Dr. Amy Martyr, who I worked for, had all of her trainers also teach classes at the Animal Rescue League of Boston in the Boston and Pembroke um, locations. And we were also responsible to volunteer our time to teach shelter dog classes to staff. So even though I was in private practice, I got to see both sides, the sheltering and private practice for dogs with behavior issues. Um, luckily, most of the behavior issues in the behavior clinic were just sort of either misfits for a, a particular situation or a miscommunication between the pets and the people. Um, but there were times in private practice as well where we had to talk about behavioral euthanasia. And the difference in private practice and sheltering is the dog has an owner and a home. So someone who really loves them. Um, and when we talked about it, it was an option, not, not, our decision as the behavior clinic, but an option if nothing else could work for that family. It was an option that was explained to them so that they could make the final decision for their dog. So anyway, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> well, and then in sheltering, it's it's a, a, a different conversation. It's a very different conversation. Yes, yes. And so I also think the difference in the conversation that in sheltering 25 years ago is extremely different than it is now um, for, for some really great reasons and for some not so great reasons. Um, okay. I wasn't, a, I, I was around 25 years ago, but I wasn't working um, in animal welfare 25 years ago. So what would you say the difference, the difference is now? So I would say one of the biggest differences, um, and the shelters that I was, um, working with were the Animal Rescue League of Boston and the MSPCA in Boston. Um, and I think now we're, we're looking at dogs that, um, are sitting sometimes for years. We're looking at dogs that there was just a, a, a thing all over the internet in Pennsylvania with a dog with a level five bite that that everyone's arguing over you would not have released a dog with a level five bite from a shelter 25 years ago that wasn't even a question okay okay do you think that we need to talk about what a level five bite means or do you think people listening um, are going to know that i think people uh, it the level five bite comes from the ian dunbar bite scale okay. um and so i think that everyone working with animals should be aware of that. And I don't know, is there a way we can link that? Yes. Yeah. We okay. Can. Okay. We can. We'll Great. do that. Great. Just so people can see it. Um, but if I remember correctly, a level five bite is, um, multiple bites with at least, um, four punctures, the half the size of the canine tooth of the dog. Um, so very serious, very serious. Yeah. 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 Um, 
so anyway, the, the dogs we were talking about 25 years ago, if there was a, a behavior dog and you wanted to stand up for it, you took the dog home and, and you worked with it and you brought it back and it was placed by the shelter if the dog was successful. Uh, so one of the behavior dogs I took, um, and I'll never forget him because I, I call him the dog that got away. Um, he was this big, beautiful, white and brindle pit bull dog. And 25 years ago, people were terrified of them, right? There just wasn't, right, if anything they did was an, was an over exact was accused of being aggressive to other dogs. And um, he then put his mouth on, I, I, I don't even want to call it a, well, I guess technically it was a bite um, to the shelter manager at the Animal Rescue League of Boston when he was in a group class, had himself worked up. Um, and the, um, manager who was the handler at the time, the dog was afraid to go through the tunnel. It was an agility class. Okay. And he pushed him and the dog spun around and, and tagged his arm. Okay. Um, and so I took him home and realized the dog was actually a big mush and just needed a, a, a ton of experience with other dogs. He was not dog aggressive. He stopped acting like a fool on a leash. Um, and today I think a dog like him, we wouldn't even question, right? Because he would have already been out in play group and nothing else would have happened. Right. 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 <laughs> so, but I mean, back then those were, those were the dogs that we were talking about as behavior issues as, and as time has gone on, we have, uh, I don't want to say allowed, but we have, we have collected dogs with more serious issues and then not giving them the behavior modification that would be needed and haven't taken into consideration that everybody, every behavior can't be modified. And then who's going to manage that situation and how safe is that situation if that dog is out in the public? Right, right. Um, and as you're telling the story, I'm thinking, I'm hearing people in my head saying, well, if you pushed me, I probably would have put my mouth on you too. Or I would, or, you know, I probably would have bit you too. Um, but there's a difference between... There's a difference between a Band-Aid bite when I'm under stress and a, a, a level five bite when... Even even under stress, a level five bite is pretty serious. That's that's really bad bite inhibition. Right. So e even if the situation is the same for a different dog, the um, the conversation around um, what to do after that would be different. If I'm Depending on the level severity yes, yes. of the bite. Of course. Sorry. Of course. Yes. Terrifying. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So just saying, we're we're really just looking at the individual dog. Um, and the individual circumstances surrounding. Yes. Yes. Every story is, is different and a bite is not a bite is not a bite. Right. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> it does. And, but now we're not talking about dogs. Like what was the dog's name? Can you, did you say that, that, that dog's name? Oh, the dog from, from many, many years ago. Yes. Scarface. Scarface. <laughs> So now we're not talking about incidents like Scarface um, when we're talking about behavior euthanasia. Correct. Um, and that's not the, what we're talking about on this podcast. Correct. Correct. Um, we, we, we've come a long way yeah. from, from there. Um, yeah. Then those dogs shouldn't be talked about on a euthanasia list. So mm -hmm. we, have, we have gotten that part right. So um, do you want to talk about the most recent um, behavior and medical euthanasia that we we just had to experience at Animal Farm? Yeah, I mean, that's part of the reason that this um, conversation came up again, right? Um, the dog that we took here, um, and I, I hesitate on him because in the end, it was a medical decision for us, even though his behavior was so out of whack. Um, and the only reason that it became such a, such chaos is we allowed other people, other organizations, volunteers to be involved. Um, and the, 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 the accusations and the questioning from those people became extremely stressful for our staff 
um, which is a pretty something that you're going to see often in any or at or any organization. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yes. We see it happen with other people. It just has never happened to us before. Um, you know, our, our volunteers, we're all on the same page. We're all very honest with each other. Um, conversations are had. Exactly. Conversations are had. I expect people to be upset. Everybody should be upset. The person making the decision should be upset. Yeah. The poor veterinarian who has to give the dog the kindest death possible when it's most of the time, you know, a healthy two-year-old dog. Um, we we should be understanding and, and respecting those people um, because it it's not an easy job. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think there's too much, um, negativity towards people that have to make these decisions. Um, that I hope we, you know, I hope people can really look at, this is not a decision anybody wants to make. Right. Um, so when it is made, um, it's not made lately. Right. And not with any malice intent. Exactly. Exactly. And, and it is made in the majority of times in the best interest of the animal, because if an animal is acting out like that, the animal is suffering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I did cut you off. Uh, you were talking about Boris. Oh, I, I don't think, I mean, I can talk about Boris, but I feel like, I mean, the situation with Boris, Boris was in an extreme amount of pain. Was Boris's exaggerated aggressive behavior towards people was it about the pain or was it who he was and he just started showing it to us as he was here longer we don't know because um boris was at least 12 we don't know for sure he had a very bad back end he had a, a situation with his back um he acted almost like he had a little bit of dementia we could not get owner information. And so the only information we had was from the vet's office where they lived him and, and Sheba, who was available for adoption. If anybody's interested, she's fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, we only got information from a vet's office. And so, you know, a vet's office and our facility are very different. So I'm assuming in a vet's office, he was um, crated often. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so his, his, what they would have seen there would be very different than what we would see here where he is loose. He has beds and couches and interactions with dogs, etc. So we didn't have a good behavior history on Boris. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, but also I think, um, to the, to the point of Boris, it is important to look at what, um, is going on with dogs medically. Um, when you are seeing behavior problems, correct? Absolutely. Yes. You always want to look at physical stuff. And with the first incident with Boris, we did um, work with our vet to get him on some, some better pain meds. Um, but on those better pain meds, it happened again. So um, for us, that was a sign that Boris um, was not happy in the situation that he's in. And there was nothing more that we could do to keep him and the people that needed to handle him safe. So to me, it was more of a medical versus a behavioral. So I, I, I'm sort of, it wouldn't have become such a behavioral euthanasia if there wasn't so much drama and hype around it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe Boris isn't the best example um, to go into the next thing that I want to talk about, but um, I want to talk a little bit about Luther and, and having dogs with behavior problems and having somebody willing to work with that dog um, and how that um, that outcome was a little bit different. And they're not really the same, but. Right, right. They're, they're the only way into. Yeah. So Luther actually was one of my personal dogs um, and it is a happy story. So stay with me. Um, but Luther as a tiny puppy, I'll never forget meeting him, this little brindle thing that um, was in the back room at the Animal Rescue League of Pembroke. And one of the girls there, Mandy, um, who used to help me with classes, asked me to look at him because um, she was afraid they were going to euthanize him because he had been pretty inappropriate 
he didn't want them handling him for vet stuff. He punctured a few people. Um, what, what eight week old teeth can puncture you? Yeah, um, yeah. And he was um, dog aggressive. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh, but at the time I was I was kind of giggling because when I saw him, um, and I don't know if I can find you a picture of him at eight weeks old, but he was this little tiny brindle thing. So um, I met him that night and I said, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to my friend who's looking for a dog. Um, and so I talked to my friend, Kenny, who was in the market for a dog. I don't think Kenny will ever forgive me for it. <laughs> um, and so I brought my dog, Dixie, at the time in to meet him. And Kenny agreed that he would meet the puppy. And when Mandy walked the puppy in the room, the puppy started screaming and growling. Um, and so I just told her to let him go. Cause I mean, Dixie, Dixie was, you know, 80 pounds of muscle. I wasn't super worried. Um, right, right. and so he ran over at her and she took the front of her body and just squished him to the ground. <laughs> um, not, not exactly positive reinforcement. Um, and, I let her do it until he stopped moving. And from that point on, he was great with her. Um, so Kenny agreed to, to give him a try. And Kenny had him maybe two weeks. And when Kenny called me and said, I can't manage this dog, he um, resource guards really badly. I had him um, at my job. Kenny was a bartender. And at the end of the night, when they were counting the money, I guess Luther stole a packet of money and then wouldn't let them have it. <laughs> yeah. So oh. no, no, no harm, no foul there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I took Luther back into my house again, cause I was determined that this dog was going to make it. I put a bunch of behaviors on him. I took him to a puppy kindergarten class, um, where I was the handler, not the trainer. And, um, we had to bring his own water bowl because he would, guard the water bowl from the puppies and the people. Um, Luther pretty much guarded everything, um, body parts, you name it. Um, yeah, it, it's funny, but not right. Um, and I had opportunities because this is what I did and I wanted to learn from him. Even, even when, um, Dr. Martyr was saying to me, you might regret this. He might really hurt a dog one day. And I thought, well, it's my responsibility, right? If I decide I'm keeping this dog, it, it'll be my responsibility. Right. But I did decide at one point to adopt him out once again. And within a week he came back um, because the people said that he was being aggressive towards the children. And again, I, I decided that he was a dog that I wasn't willing to euthanize, but I decided to keep him right. That's on, that's on me as a professional. Right. Um, so I kept Luther for his entire life and he actually became an extremely useful dog for me. Um, mm -hmm. Luther was um, pretty magical when you put him in a yard with a bunch of dogs. They just respected him because I think they're <laughs> smarter than us. Um, Luther could calm down any yard just by putting him in it. Yeah. And he didn't like dogs, but he, he learned to exist with them. Um, and, you know, I taught him things like he could resource guard his earth ball, but nothing, nothing else. So whenever he felt stressed and he felt like he needed to do something inappropriate, he would run and get his earth ball and shake it and growl and do whatever he did. Um, but he never hurt a dog or a person. Yeah. And when I met him, he wasn't even resource guarding his earth ball at that point. I mean, I think Ruckus, my dog was thought he was the best thing since sliced bread and he would just sit there and watch him and very much respected Luther, I think. Yes. Um, Everybody respected <laughs> Luther. <laughs> um, but I don't even remember him gardening his earth ball at that point. Oh, yeah, he did. You probably just didn't realize. So if oh. he grabbed the ball, that meant he was stressed about something. So anytime you introduced him to a new dog, he would go get his ball. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was his, his pacifier. Interesting. Interesting. But, I mean, it worked out. I mean, this was a happy story. Right, right. It was a happy story. Now, would would I, um, if I was not going to keep that dog, would I fault a shelter for um, 
deciding that that dog was a behavioral euthanasia under certain circumstances, I, I, I would not fault them. Yeah. It took a and lot, you, a, a lot of training and management with Luther. Um, right. And you had a lot of experience. You knew what to do with Luther, had the resources available to you to be, and, and made the decision really to make Luther um, a priority. Exactly. I, yeah. I, I had that opportunity. And like I that that was when I was working for the veterinary behavior program. You know, I'm in a lot of puppy kindergarten classes. If it wasn't through the group I was in, he wouldn't have been able to go. Let's be real. Yeah. Because with the wrong handler, he could he he could have punctured somebody else's puppy. Yeah. And how many adopters are out there that are interested in a dog that is going to be a, a project dog, basically? Yes. Yes. And a lifelong project dog. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lifelong yes. Up yes. Yeah. management. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. I mean, he was, uh, for for me, he was a great friend. Um, so I'm happy that I had him and I, I got to learn so many things that I wouldn't have learned had I not experienced him. Yeah. Yeah. Most people don't want to learn those things. Right. Right. They just want a dog to sit on their couch and get along with the, the neighbor's dog, dog walking by, you know, on their walks. Um, but it's, it's also, it's hard to know what the right decision is in any case, right? Sure. It is. It is. And, and every case is in a different situation, right? right. A dog in, in an animal control situation, a busy animal control situation is very different than a dog at animal farm or even a, a smaller humane society that has a training team. Yeah. Um, and putting aside um, the the emotion behind making those decisions and um, and just to reiterating again how um, n- nobody wants to make these decisions, we also have to think about how one inc- incident in your community, um, if you're adopting out a dog with, you know, severe behavior problems, um, how that can um, create an overreaction um, to the um, perception of where we are in animal welfare. Right, right. Um, And don't forget about the person who adopted that dog. Right. That's not the experience they wanted. Yes. Yes, there's a whole lot of, I didn't want to, I didn't want to like, Put, put aside the emotion because there is a lot of emotion on, on all sides of that. Um, yeah. But also we got to really think about um, what's right for the animals and what's right for the, right. the community. Yes, exactly. And exactly. there, there aren't fabulous sanctuaries everywhere that, that can take these dogs in. Yeah, there is not, there's not. And what is, you know, what does that life look like for a dog? A sanctuary. I mean, yeah. I mean, there, there's a rare sanctuary that does a really nice job. Um, and for the dogs who don't like dogs, even in those nice sanctuaries, that's not a great life. Right. Surrounded by dogs all day long. Yep. What else did we want to uh, talk about? I don't know. We talked about all bites not being equal. Um, I think it's important to note, too, there is no um, dog bite epidemic. Uh, most normal quote unquote normal dogs are not um causing serious injuries to people um it just happens to be the topic of our of our podcast today right it happens to be the po- topic of our podcast today and um the fact that sheltering is in in a in a tougher position now than they were mm-hmm. um a few years back mm-hmm. you know with lots more animals sitting and and decisions have to be be made for for safety yeah at this time um you know and that's not to discount there i just want to touch on this i know it's not it's not quite in line with what we're talking about but at least at this end of the country we have a lot of dogs who have been sitting for for a very long time um and i'm going to steal a quote from audrey at best friends she calls them the myths and legends dogs um And I feel like there's a bunch of dogs, not I feel like I've experienced a bunch of dogs sitting with these God awful stories 
that no one can really give you facts about, right? So mm. here we have, you know, Sally, who isn't good with dogs or strangers. But oftentimes we get those dogs out into play groups and they are fine. Um, and maybe they go out in public and they're fine with dogs, but they're with people, but they're scared in the shelter. And so I just want to say those dogs that have been sitting, I would like everyone to give a really fair shake to, and let's get real information. Absolutely. So get those play groups going, get those play groups going, um, get those dogs out on actual outings and let's, let's get real information. Not, not just hearsay. Yeah. Yeah. So head to uh, dogs play. For yep. Yep. I just want to give people the resources they need to, yes. you know, because what do you do? You have these dogs sitting and you're not sure if, you know, the stories about them are, are true or not at this point. Um, you know, we've right. seen dogs sitting for 300, 800 days. The right. dogs are just, you know. Right. Which is unkind also. So let's yes. give them a fresh start. Yes. Let, let, let's see who they really are and give them an opportunity. And if they're in a facility where somebody doesn't feel like they can give them an opportunity, then send them someplace else where they can get an opportunity. But if they turn out to be those issues, don't get angry at that facility for having to make a, a decision. Right. But in fairness to those dogs, let's see who they are and see if they can go home. Yes, absolutely. Um, also, uh, for behavioral euthanasia for, for folks out there who have had to be involved in uh, behavioral euthanasia, there's a really great, um, Facebook page called losing Lulu. Um, it's a supportive page, so it's not a, it, you know, it's talking about your story and other people who have had those stories supporting each other. Uh, yeah, that was, um, put on by Trish McMillan, who yep. we've had a conversation about this previously. Right. Um, so if you want to go back and listen to that, you're more than welcome to. Yep. Highly recommend it. Cause I think it, it's, it, it's different than this one. Same context, same, same. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine Luther's in the first one too, but um, I can't remember. I didn't, I, I'd have to go listen to it. Yeah. Um, but I think Trish has some really great, um, stories that she shared as well one of the things she says in that podcast um is that i think is really important is like we, we have to start talking about these things because if we don't everybody just thinks all the dogs were fixed and shelters and it, um it's just not the case and it makes it harder um, when we have to make those decisions right agreed agreed um yeah we can't be lying about them right right um, I don't know if I have anything else, I guess. Um, do you know what we're going to talk about next time? Uh, you know what I really wanted to talk about is um, you had been, you were talking about something on the intro, I think, that I was like, oh, people will definitely want to hear that. I think it had to do with dog handling or something along those lines. Um, shoot. I will remember and we will talk about it. Some kind of behavior modification or something? Maybe, but yeah. like on a lesser on a lesser scale. Do you do you think that we said enough times um like everybody's resources are different. I don't know if we touched on that and if we should go back and Yeah, I don't think we said it clearly enough. Yeah. Um I mean we talked about the difference between own dogs and and dogs in shelters but also everybody's resources and 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 every shelter are going to be different too and what and what resources you have available to um work on behavior issues is going to be different um for the individual shelter right and and how much you can control that environment is is really really important so even if you've got a uh, training staff if you can't control the the shelter environment it still makes it it really really difficult um and you've got to be able to give that animal a quality of life while you're working on it right so yeah i don't i got nothing else i got nothing else either and we don't know what our next podcast will be so it'll be a surprise i guess for all of us yeah yeah but this is a really hard topic um i i say this every week but um on this one as well um, if you have an experience that you want to share, 
please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we'll leave that information in the show notes as well. Great. Thank you, Nikki. Thanks, Bernice.